All right, everyone, it's noon. We're going to get started. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Haven Spanier. I'm the Director of Student and Young Alumni Engagement at the Alumni Association. And I have the pleasure of welcoming today's host. But before we get started, I do want to remind you all, if you have any questions throughout the event today, you can type those into the chat. If you're not super familiar with Zoom, there should be a little panel across the bottom of your screen. There's a chat button and you'll be able to type any questions you have in there. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce today's host. Dirk Brown is a seasoned technology executive and has been the founding CEO or managing partner of six startups, all either acquired or still growing privately. Dirk's strengths are in developing strategy and the general management of organizations undergoing rapid change. He has built companies in a broad range of industries, including semiconductors, electronics, digital media technology, medical devices, mobile apps, film and entertainment, finance, and consumer packaged goods. He also serves as the faculty director of the McNair Institute for Entrepreneurism and Free Enterprise of the University of South Carolina, where he develops and teaches entrepreneurship related courses and runs a number of entrepreneurship education and support initiatives. Dirk is a Liberty Fellow of the Aspen Global Leadership Network, a charter member of the C100 and SCRA Knowledge Economist Award recipient. He holds over 35 patents and has published over 30 technical and business papers and articles, including a book entitled Inventions Equal Money, so thank you so much, Shirk, for joining us today. We're really excited to hear from you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Sound good. Great. Um, yeah, I feel like you. <clears throat> we ate up most of our time in that intro, but that was a wonderful intro. Thank you very much. Nothing to make someone feel good, uh, like having someone else introduce them. It's my pleasure to be with everyone today. I've been asked to come and speak a little bit about entrepreneurship and how to start a business and some of the resources available at the university. Uh, it feels a little bit lonely doing this remote. So if folks wouldn't mind just going to the chat and uh, entering some comments about what you'd like to talk about today, that would be great because then I can tailor the discussion to something that might be most of interest to you. Uh, otherwise I'll go into my regular, um, regular routine. So as was mentioned, I run the McNair Institute for Entrepreneurism and Free Enterprise at the University of South Carolina. It's a fairly new institute. Uh, it was endowed by Robert and Janice McNair, um, who also did the McNair Scholars. And they wanted to put an institute at the provost level to help support entrepreneurship and education across the entire university. So our mission is pretty simple. It's just to provide world leading education and support related to entrepreneurism and free enterprise. So it's, it's a fairly broad mission. And uh, by the way, thank you for uh, Cynthia and Camille and others for starting to enter some chat because it, it helps me guide the discussion a little bit. <clears throat> so um, I'm gonna make a confession right out of the chute. So I am a professor at the University of South Carolina. I teach at the Moore School. I also teach in the College of Engineering, College of Arts and Sciences and other schools and colleges at the university. Uh, but I'm actually, feel sometimes like a bit of a poser because I still am very actively involved in building new ventures. And so, uh, as was mentioned, I've developed several new companies over the last 20 years. I've been the original founder of three. I've, I've built up over six now, maybe seven. It depends how you count them. And I've been involved in new ventures in a variety of market verticals, everything from electronics, digital media, mobile couponing, biometric security, medical devices, chemical diagnostics. Uh, I produced a film and I'm currently uh, accidentally became the managing partner of an alcohol ice cream company. So I've seen a lot of different market verticals and I have built a lot of different types of companies. And, I, and there's some stuff that's sort of generally true about any kind of business that you're building. And that's sort of the things I'll focus on today. Every market vertical has its own uh, unique aspects, of course. Uh, and a couple of questions that have already come in is our questions about guidance on starting a business. What kind of resources are available when you start a new business? How do you find your new first clients? Um, 
you know, B2B, how do you do B2B businesses versus B2C businesses? So I'll, I'll try and capture those, some answers to those questions as I talk. But when I was asked to talk about, you know, how do you start a company? That, I said, that's a pretty big topic for an hour discussion, right? Uh, so somebody said, well, hey, how about just um, give us a roadmap, you know, for entrepreneurial success. So I did what every good professor does when they're trying to give a talk. And I just went to Google and I typed in roadmap for entrepreneurial success. And here's what I came up with. So the first thing was a stage gate process flow. Many of you are familiar with, you know, you do step one, step two, step three, and you assess where you are each step. That's absolutely not the way um, you start a company in the real world. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, but I would argue that this is probably the worst way you can start an adventure is to have a very detailed mapped out plan and follow it exactly and go from one step to the other and then fail if you don't meet this, the next step. So we'll talk about sort of what we do do, but that is not what I would consider a good roadmap for entrepreneurial success. Uh, a more realistic one probably looks like this, a little bit of a winding path, but even this is linear. It's a curvy path, but it's and so it's a straight sort of shot um, in terms of the trail you go on. This is probably the best I found when I did my little Google search about sort of what a roadmap to entrepreneurial success looks like, which is to say it's a flipping mess and you just sort of move your way forward, but you move your way forward in a very sort of well thought through way. And so we'll talk about like, how do you do the first step, the next step, and the next step after that. But the trick is that Every time you make a step, you're actually learning about your business more than moving your, as much as you are moving your business forward. So I came up with my own model. I hope, it, I hope you like it. You basically start somewhere, usually with an idea, or you're trying to solve a problem, or you see an opportunity, and you plan to get somewhere, which is usually uh, a successful company, right? Um, and sometimes if you're a high-tech startup person like me, you're trying to build a company, usually to sell it to a bigger company or take it public, exit in some way. And then you got to figure out the path from your idea to the company. And so that's my simple model. And, it, and if I think about it at the highest level, there's sort of four major steps to that. One is making sure you qualify the opportunity. This is where I think a lot of people mess up when they're starting new companies, myself included, and I'll give you some examples. So qualifying the opportunity, um, figuring out what your business model really is, is another place that we often mess up when we're starting new companies. Uh, then coming up with a plan that makes sense in the context of reality. That means a plan that allows you to evolve your thinking. Um, and we call it discovery driven planning, or you may have heard the term lean startup methodology and then execution. And frankly, execution trumps all of those other things. And that's just drive passion, uh, you know, working hard and teaming up with people and people matter a lot. So if, uh, the, if I was a pure academic, I would say, well, there's your model. Uh, and if all the assumptions are correct, it's going to work exactly that way. So end of lecture. And what we need to do is make sure we, we sort of fill in the cells of all these different areas of starting a new company. But the reality is not that way, right? The reality is that something is in your planning is going to be wrong. And that's a big part of what entrepreneurship is, is planning and changing your plan constantly as you grow your new company. So for example, um, Camille was saying, you know, how do you find your first clients? Well, maybe you go after one set of clients and then you've quickly learned that they're not the right set. So you do what we call fail fast and move to another set. So the reality of, of building a company is summed up nicely in one of Yogi Berra's famous quotes, right? Making predictions is hard especially about the future. So what'll happen when you go to start a new company is, it won't look at all like this, it'll end up looking more like this. You can still be very successful, but it's almost guaranteed you'll end up at a different place than you thought you were gonna be, and you'll take a different route than you thought you were gonna take. And so we realized that in, when we teach best practices in entrepreneurship, and it's one of the key things that differentiates a small business owner or an entrepreneur from a large company. Large companies, have more predictability generally. They have a longer history. Uh, small changes don't make as disruptive uh, an impact on the company as overall. But a startup company or an entrepreneurial venture, it, you know, some small assumption that you got wrong will completely shift your entire thinking about your company. And so it's all about making sure that as we build our company, we're validating assumptions. We're validating. So when we start off with our business plan, we assume 
who our customer is. We assume what kind of price they'll pay. We assume what our business model is. Uh, and it's almost guaranteed that one or more of those assumptions is wrong. So a new venture, when you're building a new company, uh, your key thing that you want to do is figure out your, if your assumptions are correct, validate your assumptions. Because if the, all of your assumptions are right, and, and you, like you're going to assume how many customers you're going to close, who those customers will be, who your vendors are, how much you're going to pay them. If all of your assumptions are correct, then you're, it's just Excel spreadsheet math. Then you just, the company will just evolve like exactly how you planned it and you've got no problems. But the reason it doesn't evolve that way is some of your, one or more of your assumptions is wrong. And so we, a lot of our startup methodology revolves around validating assumptions. And then we do what we call fail fast. That doesn't mean you give up and leave the venture and, and shut your uh, company down. But it does mean that you redo your plan and you think in a different direction. So an entrepreneurial venture is more like a speedboat. It's not a battleship. You've got to be able to pivot quickly when you see that things are not evolving the way you thought. And so, uh, and so we call that failing fast, meaning figure out if your assumption's wrong and then, and then that's a failure, move, move in a different direction, right? That's, it doesn't mean fail the company, but it does mean don't spend a lot of time and money going down one direction before you've validated whether or not that's the right direction to go down. Um, Grace just asked me what my favorite book was on entrepreneurship or a book that I would recommend. And I'll recommend a couple in this talk, but uh, Lean Startup is definitely one that was seminal in our space. It's, it's all about this idea of discovery-driven planning. So it's about this idea of we know that our plan is, is not going to be right. And so, we, so planning to learn about what's going on in your company as opposed to planning to execute. So I'll talk about that more. Another uh, very, very uh, important book in entrepreneurship is, uh, it's a, these, these books are getting a bit dated now, but they're really important, is Business Model Generation. So that's, a, that's sort of the seminal book where we started to look at your business model on one page. And I'll talk about those books in a little bit more detail. So the reason, so here's another way to think about startups, right? Um, Mike Tyson's famous quote, everyone has a plan till they get punched in the mouth. The reality is the market is smarter than you, the market is smarter than me, and, and what something will happen. As an entrepreneur, you will get punched in the mouth. And the question is, what do you do next? And so the idea is you're going to pivot off your original plan, and you've got to be ready to kind of um, accommodate that. So in, in startup companies, our plan is more like a compass than a map. Uh, we just want to get the general direction, and we want to figure out the most important assumptions in our plan. Most important assumptions are usually who's the customer, what's the value of the customer, how much will they pay, et cetera. Um, and when we deviate from that plan, when one of our assumptions was wrong, we call that a pivot. So if you want to sound cool in entrepreneurial circles, you would say something like, uh, you know, I was validating my assumptions and um, I, 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 I hit one that was wrong, so I had to fail fast and I pivoted, right? That's, that would mean a lot to an entrepreneur. They know exactly what you're talking about. It, they know you hit the wall, you got to figure something else out. Let me talk about a, few, a couple of examples of pivots that are local, actually. Um, I don't know if anybody, for, for, a, for a pair of U of SC sunglasses as a prize, who can tell me what scene this is from? Uh, what movie this is a scene from? Avatar, thanks. I guess, Barry, I got to figure out how to get you those sunglasses, but Barry won the prize. So this is a scene from Avatar. And you remember the opening sequence, for those of you who've seen the movie, is all these trees. None of those trees are real, right? They're all digitally created. Those are all digitally created, computer-generated trees. They were created by a company called IDB that, may, that has a product called Speed Tree. It's a couple of engineering alum, Chris King and Michael Seacrest, came out of USC, U of SC Engineering College. And they were making websites back in the day when you could make a living making websites. And they made one for the city of Columbia. And the city of Columbia basically said, guys, your website's mediocre at best, um, with all due respect. We'll pay you what we owe you. But these trees look really nice because they had put in some uh, trees in the website and they had done some little animations to make the, the leaves flutter. They said, I really like these trees that you built. And then the trees started to pick up speed. This company out of Lexington, South Carolina, now dominates the digital tree market worldwide. If you're a Korean gaming manufacturer, you buy your trees from Speedtree. They have 80% market share. 
And they most they recently won a in well not so recently but five years ago won a scientific and technical academy award for their trees for digital trees. They and they you know these guys are doing great. They have a very nice lifestyle in Lexington, South Carolina, running a really compelling company. But they pivoted right. If they had stuck with their plan and continued to build websites, I can almost guarantee you they would not be nearly as successful as seeing the opportunity to make the best digital trees in the world and cornering that market worldwide, hands down. They've made the trees for a bunch of Hollywood movies. They've, they've, they've received accolades from some of the biggest directors in Hollywood. So that's a positive pivot. Um, another local example, some of you may recognize this person. Uh, I won't give a prize because I run out of sunglasses, but this is Susan Walbius, former coach of our women's Gamecock basketball players, or basketball team, right? And with her partner, Michelle Mersiniak, they were sitting there after a game, and some of you may know this story, sitting there after a game, uh, basketball game. And if you, any of you are athletes, you might have worn those uh, like athletic clothing, those light jerseys that we wear that suck the sweat away and keep you cool while you're playing. And that material is really soft, almost silky. So we're sitting there after the basketball game saying, hey, this material is really soft and uh, nice, and it would make really lovely bed sheets. And they just looked at each other and had this aha moment. And so why doesn't anybody make bed sheets out of athletic clothing material? And they went off and founded a company called Cheeks. And they almost failed because one of their assumptions was that they could sew this material in the US. And it turns out the biggest challenge they had is the material bunches up in the sewing machines and it's very hard to, um, it's very hard to sew it. They had to go to China and invent new kinds of show, sewing machines to sew this material. Again, they, they had to validate their, one of the assumptions that was not stated explicitly was you can sew the stuff, right? When you're doing a new company, my advice is write down all your assumptions explicitly, even the ones that seem obvious, like you can sew the material because that was an assumption that they should have validated upfront and they didn't validate it right away. And when they tried to sew it, they realized, oops, not so easy. They did uh, overcome that and they pivoted their manufacturing techniques, but they are now run a very successful company, again, out of Lexington, South Carolina. One final example, and I want to stay tight on time and get to some sort of real meaty takeaway for you, but one final example is my own, one of my own companies, Pandoodle. And uh, this is a digital media tech company that we almost screwed up. So somebody, somebody asked the question, what's the biggest lesson you've learned from your experience as entrepreneurship? Um, I learned a lot of lessons with Pandoodle. And, um, so we started off Pandoodle with a simple idea. I was a father of young children. I was looking online and I found that you could customize cartoons by cutting out a picture of your kid's head and sticking it on a cartoon. And I thought, you know, that's a great idea, but that's, that quality of that experience is kind of mediocre, right? It looked like a bobblehead picture on a cartoon. I said, I can do, I'm a technologist. I can do way better than that. And we developed some very sophisticated avatar generating technologies to allow you to create a cartoonized version of yourself that looked really like you. Or if you wanted it to change the color of your hair, you could do that. And we put that, embedded it natively into these animations. I mean, and we got so excited about the coolness of the tech. And we talked to a bunch of people and they loved the look of the product. We got the attention of Phil Roman, who's on the left of this picture, and Bob Bacon on the right. Phil Roman ran Film Roman, one of the world's largest animation studios. He did the Simpsons, King of the Hill, Garfield cartoons. He worked for Walt Disney, the guy, not the company. Uh, Bob Bacon on the on the other side of the picture uh, ran all of the Disney's um, animation production work uh, until they got acquired by Pixar. So we had some big names in the industry all over this. And they actually created an animation specifically for our technology called RipSmart, which is about extreme sports in Hawaii. And we piloted it in Hawaii and we had Time Warner, we had it on the Time Warner TV test pilot in Hawaii. We, 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 we validated that people were willing to pay for these customized animations. We spent probably a year and a half, maybe almost two years developing this. And then we went to raise our Series A round, our venture capital round. And we talked to the venture capitalists and they were very polite, but they, at the end of the meeting, and they were smiling, we were all excited. At the end of the meeting, they said, at the end of the meeting, they said, huh, Customized cartoons, that's cute. And I knew that we were not gonna get funding uh, from them because we didn't validate the demand on the investor side or the market size in a way that was convincing to investors. And uh, they turned around, in fact, this woman took me off, uh, 
outside the office after the meeting and said, look, Dirk, here's the deal. You've got really good technology. You're just barking up the wrong market tree. Because at the time we wanted to build a large company. She said, you can build a nice lifestyle company making customized animations, but we don't believe that you can build a billion dollar company in that space. But we do believe you can take the same technology and if you can customize advertising in video, live action video, uh, now you've got a technology that we think could be a billion dollar company. So we took that same technology and this is, a, I, I don't know how well the video is gonna stream over Zoom, so I'm just gonna use still images, but it's a really cool tech where we took analyzed videos and then we could customize brand placement. So in this van, it was a white van, we could put a Gamecock logo on the side of that van and it would look like it was there the whole time. And we could make a different uh, logo for different people viewing the video. So customized brand placement. I even, uh, this is one of my friends at Berkeley, I even put a Gamecock logo on a Berkeley student's shirt just to, just to mess with him. So it, it was uh, very powerful because we could capture shadows, wrinkles, deformation. It looked like the brand was really on his shirt. And um, it took us another almost eight years to sell that company eventually to OI2. But one of my biggest lessons was this, is that if you're thinking about this map that you know is gonna go sort of in a wiggly line from some opportunity that you perceive to some end game that you wanna build, um, spend a lot of time qualifying the opportunity at the beginning and making sure that the market's big enough and that it's really, what, it's really um, an opportunity that you wanna pursue. Because we went into the customized animation space and realized a year and a half, two years in, it wasn't the size of market that we wanted, right? Um, and we could have saved some time if we had figured that out earlier. And then also make sure your business model makes sense. So the other reason that we struggled with that market was a, it was a business to consumer market. By switching it to a business to business market, by selling advertising uh, to the brand placement advertising, uh, we could have a much more scalable uh, business. So Barry asked about business to business connection opportunities. And I'll talk about you know, how we got those, but um, there's no sort of secret sauce that the University of South Carolina will provide that other people can't as well. But we'll certainly talk about some resources that we'd be happy to offer anybody who wants to start a company. The, uh, but the best advice I can give and the biggest mistake I've made is when I didn't spend enough time figuring out what are the core assumptions in my plan? Like, how big is the market, right? And then qualifying the opportunity and qualifying the business model and not getting so hung up about the detailed planning. Think of the plan more as a compass, but getting hung up really on understanding my business in a much deeper way before I spend a lot of time and energy and money. So a couple of tools that we use, and uh, you can go look these up or we're happy to follow up on these, but some of the key tools that people use to do this kind of qualifying the opportunity and qualifying the business model are design thinking. If you haven't heard of that term, that's a really important concept. Uh, it came out of Stanford and some, and some folks elsewhere that uh, the idea here is if you're qualifying the opportunity, when you have a new idea, don't assume, like usually people will start a company because they see an opportunity or a problem. Go in and empathize with the customer of that opportunity or problem and understand what makes them tick really deeply before you go and try and fix their problems. Because sometimes what they say their problem is or what you think their problem is, is not really the fundamental root of their problem or the root of the opportunity, right? And so um, design thinking is a, is a methodology for taking a step back and instead of going forward and trying to solve the problem, take a step back and spend more time understanding if that's really the problem or if that's really the opportunity, because sometimes you'll find that uh, it's not. Another concept that we have is called lean startup methodology or discovery driven planning. And the concept here is when you're running a new venture, a new company, you wanna, you wanna validate your assumptions in the marketplace. You wanna make sure that you're solving the right problems. And the best way to do that is let the market tell you. So we do what we call uh, build, measure, learn. Uh, it's called lean startup or, or discovery driven planning where you build the minimally viable product, whatever is the least amount of effort, time and money you can spend to test a real product in the real market, right? Uh, see if the client wants what you have to offer. See if the businesses want what you have to offer. And you're really doing, what you're really doing is you're building your product or your service initially to learn what the problems are, to learn what the business model is. 
not necessarily to make money. You want to make money at the same time, of course, but spending more time up front, digging deep on the opportunity and the business model is probably where most entrepreneurs fall short. And that's probably where most of my biggest lessons are. And then it comes down to execution. So execution trumps everything. And I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm just looking at the questions to see. Um, I'll try and answer most of these through my dialogue. Um, a lot of you are asking about sort of lessons learned and career paths. And then some of you are asking about resources available at the university. So I'll make sure I cover all of that. So executing. Um, and, and the, big, the key to executing, in my opinion, is have a clear value proposition and focus, which sounds sort of obvious, uh, but you'd be surprised. And this is, again, where I screwed up more often than I would like to admit, is it's very easy to um, lose focus or get, get attracted by bright, shiny objects and lose track of what your, the real problem is that you're solving and, and what value you bring to that problem. Let me, let me talk a little bit about sort of this, this, this journey that people take, this sort of random journey. If you look at uh, uh, pivoting, we talked, about, we talked about some local examples, but most, many of you may not realize YouTube. You, we all think of YouTube as a video sharing service, right? Video, YouTube started off as a video-based dating service, and then they pivoted. They realized that the video-based dating was very limited. Why not expand it to video sharing in general? Groupon. Uh, many of you don't know the company called The Point. It doesn't exist anymore. It's turned into Groupon. But Groupon was originally uh, a social and charity platform. It was designed to rally people around charitable causes. And they had a little sort of feature that said, oh, and if you want to try and pool your resources to get a discount on pizza and, other, and massages and other stuff, we'll let you do that too. And that little feature of Groupon was what people were mostly interested in. And the charitable cause is sort of one away. Shopify, many of you know the company Shopify, started off as a snowboard equipment store. They wanted to sell snowboarding equipment. They just didn't like the purchasing interfaces that were available, so they built their own. Turns out the snowboarding equipment business went belly up, but their shopping you know, e-commerce interface took off. So many, there are many, many stories of new companies that start down a path, small businesses as well, right? That start down a path. And if you pay attention to your core value uh, and you, then it affords you the opportunity to not stay on a path that's failing, but instead fail fast and move to a path that can succeed. That's sort of the trick of most new ventures. So how do you know what your core value proposition is? We have a really good tool. This is one of the books that I'd recommend called The Business Model Generation by Oster Wilder. You can also go and Pigner. You can also go and look on, um, uh, on online and, and find lots of information about this. You don't necessarily need to read the book, but the concept here is very powerful, but very simple. And that is um, that you put your entire, so business model is basically how you make money, right? That's business model. So put your business model on one page so you can look at it like a map. And so we put the core value proposition, what, what's the main value you bring to the market goes in the middle. And then the customers and all the customer relationship stuff and the revenue streams is on the right side and the partners and the key activities and the resources and the costs are on the left side. So the left side's all about your efficiency, the right side's all about your top line revenue and, and the value proposition is the key, right? And making sure that you connect that value proposition to your customer. So I'll talk about where we used that concept early in my career. This is a embarrassingly old picture of me as a young man starting an electrical connector company out of Silicon Valley. So nobody does a startup in the electrical connector business, right? What I'm talking about here is sockets, like, um, like wall plugs, but maybe a little bit fancier. This is a socket. What you're seeing here is a picture of a socket that you would plug a microprocessor into on a computer board, right? And inside that socket are a bunch of little metal springs. So if you pulled all those little dots out, there would be little springs. And those springs connect with the microprocessor. So this is basically an electronics component. You sell this for $2.50 to Intel, and they put it on their motherboard. So here's the problem, is those springs uh, couldn't scale down as small as people wanted to. So they wanted the connections to get closer together and to get shorter. And they couldn't scale them down. 
So I came out of the semiconductor and printed circuit board industry, and I knew how to scale stuff down. And so did my partner. And we said, look, we can use printed circuit board processing to replace those springs with arrays of circuit board springs that can get very, very small. So this is like the spacing between these is on the order of half a millimeter. So uh, it was a very powerful concept in electronics. We started a company, we raised tens of millions of VC capital, venture capital money. And, um, and then, we realized, wow, we are in the electrical connector business, but the companies that are competing in that space, because it's a very old business, very scaled business. So all of our competitors were billion dollar companies, right? So we looked back at our business model canvas, and this is where we said, okay, what is our core value of our company? What can we do better and give to the customer better than anybody else? And how does that compare with what other people do? So we, we were very advanced uh, technology production company. We could make the best contact elements for connectors in the world. The competitors were much bigger than us and much stronger than us in um, being able to do logistics. So when you're delivering you know, microprocessor sockets to Intel, they want you know, 3 million sockets on their loading dock at 4.12 a.m. in Austin, Texas, you know, on Tuesday. And so that is, it's really a logistics game for those big companies as much as it is a technology game. And we realized something. We, we have a core technology we wanna to bring to our, our customers, the electronic companies, but we don't have the logistics capability. And there's no way we're gonna compete with the logistics of our big competitors. So it informed a strategy, right? By doing this, by looking at your business model canvas and thinking about where you're strong, where you're weak, a SWOT analysis is something else we do, right? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But by looking at your business model canvas, it informed a strategy where we said, gosh, we're gonna have to partner with logistics. We, we, we can't do it any other way. So how are we gonna put ourselves in a position where the big connector companies will partner with us? And we put a very aggressive patent strategy in place where we patented, we filed, we filed over 30 patents, many, many patents around the core spring technology, and then many patents around different kinds of products that could be enabled with our core technology. And then we linked all those patents together to make a very strong portfolio that would be hard to crack. And then here's the thing that was the hardest for me personally as an engineer, but probably the best strategic decision I made, and I had to argue with my board of directors over this, is then we did something called, that we called burning the fields. And the concept here was simple. We had all these inventions around this new technology that we could that could be used in the market, but we didn't have enough money to file the patents around all of them. And so we published the ideas. And by publishing the ideas, we prevented anybody else from patenting them. Because if it's in the public domain and, and it's out there, you can't patent it because it's not a new idea anymore. So we actually destroyed intellectual property and destroyed our ability to file our own patents because we didn't have enough money. Um, we just focused a few patents in a few key areas. And by, 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 by publishing all of our ideas, we prevented these big billion dollar companies from establishing their own patent portfolios because they can't patent what's already out in the public domain. And that forced them to the table to partner with us. And so Samtech was one of the smallest ones we did. They were a $400 million company, but we did time after time, partnerships and even licensing agreements with these multi-billion dollar companies um, because we realized from our business model canvas what our strategy needed to be, right? We needed to bring the total solution to market. And so that helped inform that. So these ideas of uh, design thinking and um, lean startups, so empathizing with the customer and then changing, being, having a plan that is focused on testing assumptions as opposed to just linear thinking, right? Just test your assumptions, make sure that as you build your company, you're, you, you understand exactly what the value is you're bringing to the market. And then, uh, and then looking at your business model canvas and, and staying very focused on what you do well and then partnering on things that you don't do well, right? And don't try and do everything. Don't be everything to everyone, right? And so that focus element is important. Got to be honest, uh, I screw that up more. That's the, probably the thing I screw up the most. I, uh, mo many entrepreneurs have a hard time with focus and, and staying. Like, like we, um, my current company is an alcohol ice cream company, right? 
And we got uh, a lot of interest from China, Panama, and Russia to ship alcohol ice cream to China, Panama, and Russia. Right now, we only sell our ice cream in South Carolina, North Carolina, and we just opened up Florida, right? For us to think that we should go to Russia now, no matter how much excitement they have, unless they bring a, a big checkbook with them, it's a distraction. And it's hard not to get excited about it because they're so enthusiastic and there's huge opportunity there, but we just aren't ready, right? And if I spend my time figuring out the China strategy and the Russia strategy, I'm taking my eye off the ball in getting, you know, we're down to Orlando, we gotta get down to Miami, right? Do focus on what matters. Don't lose sight of the big picture, but use your business model canvas and realize that the planning cycle and what you're doing is iterative and you're learning as you go and you iterate and you learn as you go and you iterate and guarantee you're going to end up somewhere you didn't expect to be, but you'll be pretty close and, uh, and you'll be way more successful if you tune the plan as you go. Um, and then the last, uh, the last comment I'll make and try to answer some of these questions is uh, people matter a lot a lot more than you know, I would have guessed when I started doing this 30 years ago, right? Um, and I, I have to be careful about saying bad things, but I'll say good things. So one of the things that we found in our alcohol ice cream company, uh, is the brand is proof, is uh, if we can get our team completely engaged, um, it, the company moves so much more effectively. And completely engaged doesn't always mean agreeing. In fact, it more often than not means disagreeing. But if you can have a team that has deep trust. Oh, another good book for someone asked about books. Another good book that I like is The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. It's a pretty short read. It's like one of these management fables, but it talks about what I think is the most effective model for uh, team building and team dynamics. And it really gets to the heart of what makes a great team, which is deep trust. If your team trusts you, the important part of that, and they trust each other, the important thing that comes out of that is conflict, good conflict. So conflict is not bad. Conflict sort of bets out the best answers, right? But you want to have conflict that's not political. You want to have conflict that's from the heart where people are literally arguing because they really believe and want the company to succeed and they really feel passionate about it. So if you can get a team that has deep, deep, deep trust around you, um, it, it makes the entrepreneurial journey so much better because you, you, you have someone to argue with and, and, and figure stuff out with that, and that, uh, that's effective. And then once you have the constructive conflict, you get the much better decisions, but also you get complete buy-in from the team. There's no better feeling. I mean, I, I left, uh, I worked for advanced micro devices early in my career, right? A big semiconductor company. And it was fun. Good cushy job. We had, you know, nice pay, good perks. But there's no feeling in the world like working for a team that's passionate and embraces the success of the mission. And that I've only ever found in startups uh, in my career. And um, and it comes from having a, a team that has deep trust in one another. You've got to build that trust up. And um, I've had the opposite where we've lost the trust, and it sucks. You know, you get up in the morning and it's just demotivating. So I think uh, as an entrepreneurial leader, if you can find people around you that you can truly trust, don't just tell you what you want to hear, but you truly trust, that's, that's very empowering. I've only ever started companies with partners. I've never done it on my own. I know people that have very successfully done it on their own. But one of the things that has made a big difference in my career is finding someone I could talk to, at least one other person, and then we build a team around that where we have a deep layer of trust uh, and you can argue about stuff and, and get the best outcome. So um, let me just check my time here because I thought I would share, <clears throat> I can answer some more, some of these questions, but I thought I would share one um, way that I think the University of South Carolina might help those of you that are interested in starting uh, new ventures. I'm seeing, um, cause I'm seeing a lot of questions about like any guidance on starting a side business, right? What kind of resources are available to starting a side business? How do you find your first clients? So a lot of stuff is like, how do you get started, right? Um, we have a really cool tool now at the University of South Carolina called Startup Wind. And um, you, you as a alumni can get free account on it. And if you log in, uh, it'll open up a page that looks like this. And let me just stop here. Um, and show you the real thing. 
the um, and, and please feel free to put in chat any other questions you might have while I'm doing this. But the, the, the tool, you can log into this tool and you log into what we call, when you first log in, you, you go to what we call a pre-incubation cohort. So this tool has a bunch of cohorts that we run, which are basically just groups that are, um, that are working on various types of new ventures. But if you go into the, but the first place you would come into, we call it the pre-incubation cohort. And if you come in here, you can click on this orange button, which just says create a new idea and just tell us what your idea is and what you're working on. And if you're already working on a fairly sophisticated venture and you're like a year or two into it, that's okay too. If you put it in here, what it does is it creates a card. And these cards um, allow us to view your idea. I'm gonna find one that's not confidential. So we keep these ideas confidential to us. We won't show them to anybody else without your permission. And when we look at these cards, it'll open up the idea. It'll also open up a bunch of things like customer feedback that you can go after. We can help you get. So it opens up a bunch of tools, including, um, let's see, the, including the business model canvas. So that tool I talked about where you're trying to get your core value proposition and match it up to your customer segment, that's built in here. So it, 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 it puts a bunch of tools around your idea, but more importantly, it lets us help you look at your idea and say, okay, I get it. Have you thought about this? And it lets us put some advisors around your idea. So we have a whole bunch of um, advisors that are seasoned entrepreneurs that have agreed to help us uh, at, the, at the University of South Carolina and any alumni based companies to do mentoring sessions. And these advisors will create slots in their calendar that you can request time with and then they'll go look at your idea and say, well, it's not something I really know about, so I'm not worth your while. Or they'll say, yeah, this looks like something I can help with, and they'll accept your request for advising. So any of our alumni that wants to get advice from any of our other alumni around a new venture, or any of you that might want to be an advisor, because you don't need to have a lot of startup experience, you could just know a lot about a domain, an area of domain expertise, right? We might have someone who's embedded a new skateboard wheel and you might be in the sports industry and know about skate or sporting goods industry and know about skateboards right we could use your help so we're trying to create a community here of and we have actually created we have got over 600 people on the platform so i would argue we have created a community of u of sc students faculty staff and alumni helping each other to move their businesses forward in a way that can still um, honor confidentiality of your idea if you want or Honestly, most of, the, most of the success of a new venture is execution. The, the more important thing is get, get people around you to help build those relationships, get their trust. And that's how you start to build your client base. That's how you start to build your trusted team. It can be your partners, your employees, or your advisors, or just friends of the company. But getting, and the nice thing about our alumni network is we have an inherent trust already because we're all Gamecocks, right? So we want each other to succeed. And so getting that set of resources around one another uh, is critical. By the way, I've put my new ventures on here and I'm using it to tap our alumni network for them to help me with my new companies, right? That I'm doing on the side. So I think it's a very powerful um, capability that we put in place at the University of South Carolina at a time when uh, it's hard to get a cup of coffee with the people, right? Uh, we're coming out of COVID, hopefully, and it's a long journey ahead of us. And people are now more comfortable with helping one another and talking to one another online. By the way, this tool has built into it embedded, embedded video conferencing in a way that you don't have to share personal information with one another either. So that allows us to connect our students with alumni. So if our students, because we're not allowed to uh, we're not allowed to connect our students with any old alumnus, right? Because we, 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 we worry about the safety of the students. But by doing it through this tool, we can. And so we'd really appreciate your mentoring of our students. We think we might be able to help you with your new ventures and create a community of um, U of SC entrepreneurs that are helping one another. So to answer the questions I'm seeing here about B2B connections, first clients, guides on starting a new business, resources available, if you... If we put their ideas here, we will, we will help try and figure out what resources are the best. And, and we don't want to own, we don't want to own all the work. We, but we can help facilitate, but I'm happy to do a lot of the work, but we can help facilitate 
connections. And I think when you're starting a new venture, it's the connectivity of the entrepreneur with the critical resources, be it cash, be it talent, be it anchor customers, your first customers, whatever it is, knowledge, um, you know, we need to help each other get connected to those resources. And the best practices are actually pretty simple. Uh, I think the best practices are design thinking, validate the assumptions, lean startup methodology, and make sure your business model canvas is well understood. If you do that and you execute with a trusted team, you know, then you got, then it's, then you just figure it out as you go and you, know, you hit the walls, you get back up, you keep going, you pivot if you have to, uh, you break through the wall if you can. So that's my simple view of, of sort of how to start new companies. I'll pause here and see if there are any questions on the chat that you might have. Um, I wouldn't mind giving a little more professorial lecture about why this is so important for the country, but I don't wanna, but I'm guessing most of you are more interested in pragmatic, pragmatic advice, and that would be the, the, the crux of it. Any other questions on chat? So I'll, I'll talk about, um, let, me, let me spend a couple of minutes talking about um, why this is important for the country and then also a barriers to entry, creating barriers to entry, which I haven't talked about, but it's another key thing I think are important for entrepreneurs. So this is a graph that I think surprises many people. Oops, I lost the chat now. I wanna make sure I don't lose the chat. Let me say, oh, there we go. Uh, this is a graph that surprises many people. This is a plot, and I, I know you probably can't read too well the axes, so I will. Oh, uh, Camille asked if the site costs money. Uh, yes, it does. We're paying for it. So it's free to you. So it's free to all of our alumni. You can log in, get a free account, and we will support you. Um, this is a plot that shows the net job creation as a function of time. And you probably can't read the axes, but the very top is 5 million jobs created. The very bottom is 5 million jobs lost. The left-hand side is 1988. The right-hand side is 2012. So what you're seeing is decades of job creation and loss in the US, right? And the blue line, the blue circles at the top are job creation from companies that are zero to five years old. The red triangles are companies that are six to 10 years old, and the yellow triangles are companies that are 11 years old or more. This red line here is zero net jobs created. So what you're looking at is basically data that says every net job created in this country for the last several decades has been from companies that are less than six years old. So, uh, that doesn't mean that large companies aren't growing, but they're, they're consolidating at the same rate that they're growing. So they're losing as many jobs on average as they're gaining. And all the net job growth in this country is from early stage entrepreneurial companies, right? And so entrepreneurs are the ones that are growing the economy at the end of the day. But here's the other thing. Even if you're working for a big company, and I don't know who's on this talk that wants to stay with a big company, more power to you. Um, I'm working for the University of South Carolina, right? That's a billion dollar company right there. But even if you believe that you're going to be working for a large company, you're not going to be doing this, right? You're not going to be doing recurring, repetitive tasks because you'll be replaced by an algorithm or a robot, right? An algorithm or a robot is going to take over most of the recurring activity. And you're going to have to, even in a big company, be an entrepreneur. You're going to have to think creatively and leverage innovation to create sustainable value. So that's our definition at the University of South Carolina of entrepreneurship is leveraging innovation to create sustainable value. If you don't do that, you'll be replaced. 70% of the Fortune 1000 companies churn every five years. Um, about half the, every 10 years or so, close to half the Fortune 500 companies get replaced. What does that mean? It means that the innovative growing companies are taking over the large incumbents. And it's happening on a more and more uh, increasingly rapid rate. And the big companies that understand this are getting very entrepreneurial. I show this picture to people sometimes and they say, they think that this is some tech startup in Silicon Valley. It's not, it's IBM, IBM offices in Austin, Texas. Why? Because IBM gets it and they're trying to 
inculcate entrepreneurial activity into the, the DNA of IBM. And they've got little pods of entrepreneurial activity within you know, a $100 billion company, right? Think about this. Uh, think about other large companies. Philips, the product of the year in 2012 was a light bulb, right? The Philips Hue light bulb. Philips created the innovative product of the year. GE uses this lean startup methodology I talked about, this build, measure, learn. GE uses it to design and build refrigerators, right? So all of these techniques I've been talking about, design thinking, lean startup methodology, business model canvas, it's not just entrepreneurship with a little E, like two people in a garage trying to start a business. It's entrepreneurship with a big E, meaning leveraging innovation to create sustainable value. Every company that's going to be successful is going to be doing entrepreneurship by that definition. And so it's really important for your career, whether you're starting a new company or you're working for a big company, to get that and to understand that this idea of discovery-driven planning and constantly validating assumptions and growing the company, but learning about what works and what doesn't work at the same time, because the world is constantly changing. And then I would argue creating barriers to entry for the other people coming behind you, which is things like intellectual property, uh, know-how, uh, maybe, maybe getting first mover advantage, these types of things, right? And we're doing a lot of that right now with our ice cream company is we're first to market with a very innovative product. And so we're, we're creating barriers behind us um, and through our know-how and our intellectual property. So that's the fun. It's a fun, fun, fun career to be entrepreneurial. And you can do it in a big company or a small company. And you're probably doing it now, even if you don't know it. Because if you're not doing it now, you're being replaced by an algorithm or a robot. And so just doing it in a mindful way where you use these tools and you understand what you're doing uh, can be very powerful. So somebody asked, Mark asked if, uh, like if the group could have my slides and I'm happy to share my slides with anybody who wants them. And uh, someone else said, Caleb, oh yeah, you wanted to know um, for young entrepreneurs starting out, does it take money to make money? Uh, it takes resources. So money is a proxy, right, for resources. You don't really need the money. What you need is the things that the money buys. And so good entrepreneurs are very uh, cash efficient and they figure out how to get resources in clever ways, not always by paying for them, right? Um, I'll give you some tips that might irritate some of my colleagues. So uh, in Silicon Valley, for example, when, I'm, when I was building tech startups, we always used our attorneys and our uh, accountants as banks. Please don't be mad at me for anybody who's an attorney or an accountant. But you know, a law firm in Silicon Valley or actually anywhere will oftentimes give a startup company some credit, right? We would get $10,000 worth of legal fees that we didn't have to pay right away because we needed those legal fees to go off and raise the money, right? Um, that to pay the law firm. And they were betting on the long haul. So you can oftentimes get your service providers to bet on you. You can get people to work for equity or for the promise of a job later, right? And you can sort of conserve your cash up front. You can, uh, some of the other resources that are less obvious but just as valuable are things like contracts or exclusive especially if they're exclusive contracts or letters of intent like if you have a letter of intent from a large b2b customer that says i'm going to buy in fact i'm working with a company right now that has a letter of intent from boeing that says that they're going to buy eight million dollars of product when the company has the product ready why is that a resource because now they can take that letter of intent even even though it's not legally binding they can take that to an investor or venture capitalist and use it to de-risk the venture, to say, look, I've got this letter of intent from Boeing. So entrepreneurs think about cash, because if you don't have cash, cash, running out of cash is the number one way that companies die. So the short answer is don't run out of cash, Caleb. But cash is a proxy for resources. And think about how to get those resources inexpensively or free, in addition to making sure you have cash, right? Um, some companies can grow organically, some companies cannot. I've very rarely um, grown organic companies just because of the nature of what I like to do, like billion dollar companies. And so normally you have to raise several million before you can think about being profitable for those kind of companies. But other companies you can, you know, if you're a consulting company or if you're selling something that's not too expensive to make, you can make money right away um, and then use that money to reinvest in the company. So, so there's lots of ways to grow the company. But don't get hung up on cash for cash's sake. Get hung up on what resources do you need to execute your plan and how you're going to get those resources. And usually it's by paying for them with cash, but there's other ways to do it. 
any other questions about anything related to entrepreneurship? I'm, uh, I'm down to kind of the last five minutes and I can say, um, as I look for questions on the chat, I'll just say, uh, even if it's just changing your point of view about what you're doing in your day job, uh, to think more entrepreneurially and to use some of these entrepreneurial tools, it is so rewarding to view the world through an entrepreneur's lens because you, you, um, you're thinking about bringing value to the world and leaving it a better place than you left it. And, and in many ways, I would argue you're living your best life by uh, understanding really what the problems are, the core problem, design thinking, but really what the core problems and the core opportunities are, empathizing with the end user, be it a business or a, com or a customer, coming up with real solutions that make sense through this lean startup methodology. So don't just pick a solution and assume it's the right one, right? Test it, test it, test it. And then understanding the optimal business model canvas, where you should partner, where you should do it yourself, how you, what your relationship is with your customer. What are really the core things that you do that matter? What are your real costs? What are your real, what are your real revenues? If you look at that, even if you're just a cog in the wheel, right? But looking at the big picture and understanding what value you bring and how you can optimize it, there's no more satisfying feeling in the world, I don't think, than doing that especially when you're executing with a team that gets it, wants it, and you can trust, right? It's a really powerful way. And, and frankly, I'll end by saying, I, look, I work for a big organization, University of South Carolina, and I run an institute there, but we, we run it like an entrepreneurial venture. We, are, we do our business model canvas. We do our design thinking workshops. We talk to the students, we interview them, we say, hey, what do you want, right? I know what I think you want, but what do you want? What do you need, think you need? I know what I think you need. And so living your life that way, and by the way, I, you know, of course, being a real entrepreneur, I take this all the way home. I think I live my whole life this way. There's another interesting book for those who are really fans. There's that business model canvas book I talked about, the, design, the, the business model generation. There's a business model you book where you can look at yourself as a business model canvas. What are your core value propositions, right? Who is your customer? What do you bring to the table? Where do you need to partner? So these concepts go everywhere from the individual all the way to, you know, Fortune 100 companies, IBM and GE, right? So it's a very, very powerful concept if you think about entrepreneurship through that lens of leveraging innovation to create sustainable value. And if you're not doing that, well, what's the point? So I'll, uh, I guess I'll end there. It's uh, three minutes to go. If there are any questions, feel free. Otherwise, if you're eating your lunch, you can uh, finish it up in peace. Well, thank you so much for all of the info that you shared with us about entrepreneurship. I know I definitely learned a lot during this. I'm sure that everyone did as well. If anyone has any last minute questions, make sure to type those in the chat. But I will be sending out the recording to everyone who registered. If you want to go back to any of the parts today, um, as well as a survey, so we can keep improving these events for you all. But thank you everyone for joining us today. And if you're interested in joining us for any more online events, you can view those at uofscalumni.org slash events. And thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Y'all have a wonderful day.